Good evening and welcome to our continuing um, uh, discussion of life lessons from or lessons from the life of Joseph. Uh, last week we saw him sold into slavery by his brothers and we're going to continue from there um, after we have the word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to learn from uh, one of your people, uh, but more perhaps more directly one of um, the patriarchs and the examples that were left to us um, that apply to not only the Hebrews of the time, but uh, to all people uh, in all history. So we appreciate the opportunity to uh, unpack that and uh, thank you for the opportunity to do so and the people that have been with us each week to follow along. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, again, Joseph has been sold into slavery, and there are a couple of things that we want to watch for as we go forward with Joseph. Um, first of all, and not surprisingly, Joseph finds God. Now, I'm not saying that he didn't know him before, but Joseph beco or God becomes more of a focus for Joseph. Um, and you can imagine, as he is a prisoner, uh, of the Midianites that are taking him down in their caravan to Egypt um, that he's had plenty of time to think and to gain some clarity about just what the world is like, just who he can depend on and who he can't. Um, now what I mean by that is his family, his very brothers, um, he obviously missed uh, just how much they hated him um, but his very brothers, his family, those people that you would generally depend on are the ones that put him in this situation. Um, I'm sure that was a rude awakening. In his dreams and interpretations of them, he gave no credit to God previously. And obviously, um, based on the text, the wording in the text, he relished sharing them with the brothers uh, that did not hold him in high esteem. Um, their meanings did not have to be interpreted, Joseph's early dreams did not have to be interpreted because their meanings couldn't be missed and his brother certainly did not miss them. Neither did his father for that matter. Uh, he was also very aware of being his father's favorite and probably had been protected by jo uh, Jacob's watchful eye as he grew from a child into a youth. Joseph could easily have thought that this favor favoritism would protect him his entire life and would keep him safe from anything that uh, real or imagined that his brothers or anyone else for that matter might um, think of doing to him. Um, I'm sure that he was shocked when he learned what a cruel and perverse world this could be, even, again, when it concerns family. Envy and jealousy are evil in themselves and are also the precursors of darker things than just mean thoughts. In any event, I'm sure J uh, Joseph uh, gained a certain amount of clarity uh, while in the custody of the Midianites and on their way to Egypt. That's not a short trip even in those days with camels and so forth. Um, it was a long and trying trip. And of course, Joseph was not afforded any special treatment like he had been up till now. Uh, there was certainly nothing in the circumstances surrounding him at this time that would be an encouragement to his heart. Now there's no person in the Old Testament, in my opinion, whose life um, the purpose of God is more clearly seen than Joseph. The providence of God uh, is manifest in every detail of Joseph's life. The hand of God is upon him and the leading of the Lord is evident even if it's not seen by Joseph himself. Um, but it's interesting that Joseph is the one patriarch that God never spoke to. Um, God spoke to Abraham, he spoke to Isaac, God spoke to um, uh, 
his father Jacob. But Joseph, through all of this uh, trial, God never made himself manifest to him uh, in a vision or a uh, conversation or any kind of uh, appearance, anything like that, as he did to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, why was this? Well, I don't know for sure because the Bible doesn't say, but it's easy to follow God, more or less, when God has appeared to you so that you don't have any doubt about the fact that he did appear to you and provide you with some direction. For example, in John 20, verse 29, it says, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet believe. Uh, there's a difference between getting a direct word, if you will, and going on faith and not by sight. And maybe this was God's beginning with the Hebrew nation of getting them to follow his direction by faith. In any event, when the Ishmaelites, Midianites, made it to Egypt, Joseph was sold to Potiphar. We're told he was a captain of the guard, which may mean that he was a captain of the small inner, inner, inner circle that was the personal bodyguard of Pharaoh. It may mean that he was the capital of the pal or the captain of the palace guard. Um, whatever, what it did mean was that Potiphar was a man to be reckoned with. Potiphar had access, as we like to say today. He was an important man that other people paid attention to. Now, Potiphar, just kind of as, a, as an aside, Potiphar may well have been a title. Uh, it means having to do with the sun, um, but it has come down to us as a personal name today, and uh, we're not gonna argue about that one way or the other because it's not important. But just as an aside, Potiphar may have been a title rather than a personal name, but um, nonetheless, uh, that is his name to us. Now, over a period of time, we're not told how long, Joseph proved himself to be the most trusted of all of Potiphar's servants. Um, now, the text would lead us to believe that Potiphar's servants were Egyptian. He has introduced a Hebrew into the household, and this Hebrew has slowly, or maybe rapidly, become Potiphar's favorite and most trusted servant. Now, just kind of a, a heads up, how did it work out for Joseph being the favorite of his father? Didn't work out so good. Well, now he finds himself yet again the favorite of Potiphar. And by allowing Joseph to oversee everything that he had, this, was a, this provided Potiphar a great deal of peace of mind. It allowed him to relax a little more, to focus on his men, to focus on Pharaoh, his duty to Pharaoh. Uh, he didn't have to worry about his household. In fact, everything prospered that Joseph touched. And in that relationship, because Joseph was blessed, Potiphar was blessed. And uh, if you think about 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 14, it talks about in, those ver in that verse that a woman who is married to an unbelieving husband, that unbelieving husband will be blessed as well through um, indirectly through the blessings that are bestowed on the believer. The same thing happens in this instance. God wants to bless Joseph, so as he blesses Joseph as a servant serving someone else, that someone else is going to be blessed as well, indirectly through Joseph. If we stop to consider the position that Joseph held, we're surely safe in assuming that he had a good education. We don't know where he got it, but he had a good education. Common sense and figuring out how things work 
both in a material sense and apparently politically. Um, I don't mean governmental politics at this point, but the politics of interpersonal relationships. And he had a profound understanding of right and wrong. And to top it off, most likely, he spoke Egyptian. Now, where he learned that, I do not know. Um, but if Potiphar was communicating with him directly, um, either Joseph spoke Egyptian, which is what I believe because of the ensuing um, story of Joseph, or Potiphar spoke Hebrew, which I doubt um, because the um, high-flown, uh, highly cultured Egyptians generally would not stoop to learn um, a language as uncultured as Hebrew. In short, this is not your average young man, and the depth of Potiphar's trust and reliance on him cannot be overstated. As the text said, he did not know what he even had except the bread that he ate. I cannot imagine any more comfortable a position to be in than to not have to worry about a thing, just to sit and eat when I'm called to the table. And that's the position that Potiphar found himself in because of Joseph's. Now, in uh, these verses, uh, the f first verses of uh, chapter 39, uh, through the first five verses, we're told this. Uh, we're told about the uh, virtues of Joseph being extol extolled by his master. And at the tail end of verse 6, we are going to have extolled for us his physical virtues. Apparently, he was very handsome and well-built. And these these virtues did not go unnoticed by the mistress of the house. And verse 7 goes on to set the stage for what will come after. Mrs. Potiphar um, lets loose her first attempt to seduce Joseph. Now, Joseph's reply, um, in my opinion, or my taking of this verse, and applying a little human nature to it, Joseph's reply to her contains both a little bit of the old Joseph when he says, there is no one greater in the house than I, a little bit of the old Joseph, but also he has gained some piety because he says he cannot sin against God. So in these verses, or in this verse, uh, we see a little blending or a mixture of the personality of Joseph as he grew up, but also his recognition of his duty to God. We are told that this was not a one-time uh, attempt at seduction, but it goes on day in and day out. The scenario went on day after day after day with Joseph paying her no mind. This is not an average young man. Of course, we have no notion of Mrs. Potiphar's charms or lack thereof, but regardless, Joseph has proven himself able to withstand them. But you can imagine how Mrs. Potiphar is dealing with this. I picture, um, I remember years ago there was the uh, Cleopatra where Elizabeth Taylor was Cleopatra and Richard Burton was uh, Mark Anthony and how Cleopatra and of course Elizabeth Taylor was one of the in my opinion one of the most beautiful women that ever lived she's reclining on a couch and um, being rather coy with um, Mark Anthony and ultimately it comes down to Mark Anthony breaks he doesn't become so much a Roman soldier anymore um, and at a very high level to boot he becomes more the plaything 
of Cleopatra. But can you imagine this important woman, the wife of a man that daily had access to Pharaoh's palace, being rejected by this squint of a boy, and he a slave to boot? This had to make her nuts. Joseph walked by her, in any event this last time, she grabbed his robe, and he took off like a scalded cat. Of course, this woman was humiliated beyond belief. Not only did he say no, but when physical hands were placed upon him, he runs from her. I cannot imagine a more humiliating rejection. He not only rejected her, but rejected her so violently, he ran like she had the plague. And in a way, she did. The plague of sinning against God, sinning against his master who had put him in this position. The mistress of the house called the other men around the house and told them that Joseph had tried to rape her. She plays the race card to probably play on the other men's jealousy, them being Egyptians, he being a Hebrew. You know that they were jealous of him, just like his brothers were. And there's that word jealousy again. That a Hebrew had been made overseer to them that a Hebrew had been given access to the entire house, everything in it, and all of the estate where they could not go there. Let's take a moment to consider just how much good it has done Joseph to be the favorite. He was his father's favorite, and it got him, first of all, they wanted to murder, his brothers wanted to murder him, but at the very least, it got him sold into slavery. Now he's Potiphar's favorite, and it gets him framed for rape. This time, he gets into trouble not for being arrogant and flaunting his favored position, but for doing what is right for his master and God. This gets him in trouble. When Potiphar gets home, you can bet his wife was initially all tears while she was telling him what happened. Then her voice changes to one of scorn for Potiphar, to Potiphar, um, for bringing the Hebrew into the house. The servant, she says, the servant you brought here. Does this remind you of another instance of passing the buck? Remember Adam and Eve in the garden? Just 38 chapters before this one? That woman you gave me. And oh, the devil, the serpent made me do it. Ms. Potiphar says, the servant you brought here, trying to deflect the whole problem back onto her husband. I don't know if this is the way that it happened, but you can almost envision it. Over time, we don't know how much time uh, lagged here, but over time, Miss Potiphar is constantly chirping in her husband's ear. Her voice becoming more and more accusatory and vindictive. I suspect that Potiphar had some experience with this prior to Joseph ever appearing in the house. But as you read verses 19 and 20, you have to think why when Potiphar got home and his wife is in tears, probably all askew on a recliner uh, or, or on a chaise, and she's lamenting what happened, why didn't Potiphar just grab Joseph and kill him? Most men, well, I'm speaking for myself, myself included, and a lot of men that I know, upon going into the house and finding someone 
attempted to rape my wife and the perpetrator is still there, I, don't, I can't answer for what I did. And Potiphar with a slave was well within his rights. No one was going to question him about killing a Hebrew slave for any reason, let alone attempted rape. Why did Potiphar not immediately kill him? He was certainly within his rights. You would think that if he respected his wife's virtue, he would at the very least have lashed out in some way. I suspect that Joseph is not the first person that Mrs. Potiphar had attempted something like this. Again, we don't know. Joseph is the center of the story, but I look at Potiphar's reaction, and I have to think that somewhere along the way, Joseph was not the first person, and he was not unused to his wife's behavior. Yet he didn't kill Joseph. We're not told that he even caused him to be physically punished or to take advantage of any other of the forms of punishment that he had uh, re re result to. The text tells us that he took Joseph to the prison used to house the king's prisoners. Now, to be sure, it's still a prison, but typically prisons for household or political prisoners of the king is not the same prison for the common man who committed rape or murder or theft or something of that nature. It's a different type of prison, but still a prison. By the way, as an aside, can you imagine Potiphar's Potiphar's wife's reaction to this. I don't know how Potiphar could stand being in the house. Again, um, this leads me to believe that Potiphar had a pretty good idea of his wife's character by simply escorting Joseph to the prison for the king's prisoners. Can you see that Joseph is serving God in all this? I mean, God is not, or Joseph is not like Daniel, who falls on his knees constantly and prays and defies uh, Nebuchadnezzar's edicts uh, for his God. No, Joseph only mentioned God in that one line when he told Mrs. Potiphar that he could not sin against God by lying with her. But he's serving God nonetheless. When he went down to Egypt, it was a land full of idolatry. If you pick up any book on ancient Egypt, page after page will simply be um, one temple after another, one god or goddess after another. You'll see uh, tombs that were excavated and there are statues and statuettes of god and, or gods and they're covered with gold and gems and so on and so forth. There was nary a more idolatrous pagan country than Egypt. In that land of idolatry, Joseph maintained a testimony for the living and true God and maintained a high moral standard. When this woman enticed him, he said, my master has turned over everything to me but you. You are his wife. Notice also that Joseph puts a very high estimate on the sanctity of marriage. I don't know how Joseph would have reacted if it had been Potiphar's daughter. I don't know. We're not going to go there. But Mrs. Potiphar was Potiphar's wife. And Joseph specifically said that. So one doesn't have to go too far to believe that he had a high opinion of the sanctity of marriage. And God has given marriage to all mankind. When a person begins to despise the marriage vows, he's beginning to despise God. A 
man who will break his marriage vows will generally feel free to break any vow he has made. Joseph here is attempting to be true to God. We're reminded that once again, the Lord is with Joseph. It states here that God was with Joseph and showed him mercy. I find, in a way, that's rather a confusing verse. And I think that the text stating that God showed him mercy is an interesting thing for it to say. After all, what is the biblical definition of mercy? It's God extending his patience and forbearance to one who deserves to be punished. Or God extending his kindness and grace to one who does not deserve it. It's fascinating to me that here in these verses, following right on the heels of what happened in Potiphar's house with Mrs. Potiphar, the term mercy is used for Joseph. It seems strange that mercy is used in this instance because we're under the impression from the text that Joseph has been unfairly used and unfairly judged. But the term mercy here would tend to remind us that Joseph is a sinner. Regardless of how he performed or did not perform, if you'll forgive the term, with Mrs. Potiphar, he is still a sinner, and by the use of the term mercy here, we're reminded of that. Perhaps this is God's reminder in the text that none are innocent. Or maybe we need to remember that God with us does not mean we will not face trials, many of which may arise from something not of our doing. Nevertheless, moving forward, the text says that God shows mercy to Joseph, and soon, upon delivery, um, the prison warden also becomes aware of Joseph's good qualities. Again, we don't know how long it took for um, Joseph to get into the warden's good graces. It may have been that when Potiphar delivered him, uh, Potiphar may have spoken to him on the side and said, keep an eye on this boy. He may be able to help you in your work. I don't know. But in any event, he comes to have all the authority within the prison that he had in Potiphar's house. I'm sure that life wasn't as sweet as in the home of Potiphar. But I'm also sure that Joseph enjoyed whatever comforts, if any, were available in that particular environment. He has everything in the prison but the freedom to leave the prison. The hand of God is obvious in this young man's life, but over against it are the terrible things that happen to him. There are rabbis that have written that if God's hand was on Joseph, I would rather his hand not be on me. God was with Joseph, guiding his every step. But look at the things that have happened to him. And now he finds himself in prison. How discouraging would this be to the average person? How discouraging would it be to the average Christian? But the interesting thing is that the Lord is with Joseph. We're told that in Scripture time and time again. Although he does not appear to them, as he had to the other patriarchs, he shows him mercy. First, he causes the warden of the prison to like him and to trust him. 
Although Joseph is naturally an attractive young man and has tremendous ability, the important thing to note is that all of this would have come to nothing had God not been with him. He would not have been used for God. Certainly, he did not have to be a handsome young man for God to use him. And certainly, being a handsome young man would not cause him to have any particular favor with God. But God is with him and is leading him. These experiences are moving toward the accomplishment of a purpose that is Joseph's life. Maybe Joseph recognized this, and it gave him a buoyancy, a, a, uh, an attitude of bouncing back, of optimism, that circumstances could not get him down or keep him down. He lived on top of his circumstances. Certainly, certainly the chastening of the Lord is going to yield fruit in the life of Joseph, and we're going to see that fruit going forward. The story of Joseph reveals the fact that not every man can be bought. Not every man has a price. Satan says that every man does, but there have been several men throughout Scripture and throughout human history that Satan could not buy, and Joseph was one of them. Job was another, and of course the Apostle Paul was another one yet. Satan despises mankind, but these and many more are men whom Satan, whom Satan found he could not buy. Uh, we will continue uh, in the life of Joseph with his um, experience with the prison warden and in the prison um, next Thursday. Uh, in the meantime, thank you for being with us, and uh, let's join, a, join us in a word of prayer, please. Lord, thank you for um, the example of Joseph, the example that um, we do have the capacity to be true to our faith, to be true to you, Lord. Help us to work with the aid of the Holy Spirit to grow and strengthen that ability to be yours and yours alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Good night.